Good afternoon, and welcome to True Crime Mysteries. If you are new to the channel, hello and welcome, and if you're returning, welcome back. We are doing another serial killer deep dive, and today we are discussing Nanny Doss, who would come to be known as the Giggling Granny Serial Killer. But with that being said, let's get into it. If you passed Nanny Doss on the street, you would have assumed she was just another jovial grandmother. Certainly, you wouldn't think she was capable of murder. But between 1927 and 1954, Doss committed a string of crimes that defied expectations, earning her several nicknames, including the Giggling Granny, the Lonely Hearts Killer, the Black Widow, and Lady Bluebeard. Nanny Doss was born November 4, 1905, as Nancy Hazel, though she was rarely called Nancy. She started going by her nickname Nanny from the age of five. Her parents, Louisa and James F. Hazel, were farmers who raised Nanny and her four siblings on their family farm in Blue Mountain, Alabama. Growing up, Nancy's life was less than idyllic. Her father was abusive and controlling, and her mother, though Nanny described her as a loving parent, turned a blind eye to the abuse inflicted on her children. While Nanny was able to attend school up to sixth grade, her father would constantly pull her out of class to work on the farm, so she dropped out entirely. When Nanny was seven years old, she and her family boarded a train to visit relatives in southern Alabama. During the trip, the train made a sudden stop and she hit her head on a metal pole in front of her. She wasn't quite the same from then on out, and suffered from frequent migraines, blackouts, and depression. Later on, Nanny was allegedly sexually assaulted by several local men. She told her father, but he didn't believe her. She grew to hate him for his abusive and controlling ways. While other children went to school, Nanny and her siblings worked on the family farm. While other teens wore makeup and went to dances, she and her sisters were forbidden from wearing attractive clothing or socializing at all. To escape her reality, she'd hole up in her bedroom crocheting and reading her mother's romance magazines, combing through the Lonely Hearts columns and fantasizing about the day her Prince Charming would save her from her father. In 1922, when Nanny was 16, that day finally came. Her first husband was Charlie Braggs, who she met while working at a linen factory. They married after four months of dating, with her father's approval. Charlie was the only son of a single mother who forced him and Nanny to live with her after the wedding. She was just like James, controlling and abusive. Nanny wrote about the situation, saying, I married as my father wished in 1921 to a boy I only knowed about for four or five months who had no family, only a mother who was unwed, and who had taken over my life completely when we were married. She never seen anything wrong with what she'd done, but she would take spells. She would not let my own mother stay the night. Between 1923 and 1927, Nanny and Charlie had four daughters. The births had been hard on her, and her life was an endless cycle of being pregnant, giving birth, raising the other children, caring for her horrible mother-in-law, all while also dealing with an unfaithful husband. Charlie was rarely home. He would leave without explanation for days at a time. Nanny was severely unhappy and began drinking and smoking heavily to cope with her life. Then, in 1927, their two middle daughters died from suspected food poisoning, Although both deaths were ruled accidental at the time, family members and law enforcement officials now believe these killings were the beginning of Nanny's decades-long killing spree. Nanny collected $500 from each of the girls' life insurance policies. Afterward, Charlie took their firstborn daughter, Melvina, and fled because he was afraid of Nanny. He was suspicious that Nanny had killed the two girls on purpose and refused to eat anything that Nanny cooked for him. Charlie left his youngest daughter, Florine, alone with his mother, who mysteriously died shortly after, and Nanny took custody of the child. Nanny later got a job working in a factory to support her and Florine. The next summer, Charlie returned with Melvina and his new girlfriend. 
and the couple officially divorced in 1928. After the divorce, Nanny got full custody of Melvina as well as Florine. Nanny continued her search for true love, and in 1929, she turned to a Lonely Hearts magazine column. There, she began corresponding with a man named Robert Franklin Frank Harrelson, who wooed her with romantic letters. They married quickly and moved to Jacksonville, Alabama, with her two daughters in tow. Not long into their marriage, Nanny discovered that she didn't know Robert all that well, and he might not have been the Prince Charming she had hoped he was. He was an alcoholic, and he had a criminal record that included assault charges. Still, they stayed together. Nanny's eldest, Melvina, got married in 1942. A year later, Melvina gave birth to a baby boy she named Robert. Two years later, Melvina had another baby, this time a daughter. Nanny was helping care for the newborn while Melvina slept, and Melvina, exhausted from labor and on a number of sedatives, thought she saw her mother stab the baby's head with a hat pin, killing her. Nanny allegedly told Melvina's husband and sister that the baby had indeed died, all while holding a hat pin in her hand. Doctors were not able to confirm the newborn's cause of death, and it was ruled an accident. Melvina and her husband's marriage crumbled with the loss of their daughter. Melvina had started dating a soldier in July of 1945. She and Nanny had a fight about the new boyfriend. Nanny did not approve of him. After a heated argument, Melvina went to visit her father and left her son Robert with Nanny. Robert died mysteriously while sleeping that night. His cause of death was determined to be asphyxia due to unknown causes. Nanny collected the $500 in life insurance that she'd taken out on the boy just two months before his death. Melvina brought up the death of her children with other family members, but no one listened when she accused her mother of killing her own grandchildren. Nanny's marriage with Robert had never been a happy one. She had put up with the drinking, the yelling, and the cheating for 16 long years. One night, Robert went out to celebrate the end of World War II with a heavy drinking bender. When he got home, he tried forcing himself onto Nanny. He wanted me to go to bed with him. I refused, Nanny said. In an act of revenge, she found his stash of moonshine and laced it with rat poison. I went and got the whiskey bottle out of the flower bin in the kitchen and poured poison into it. I thought I'll just teach him a lesson, she said. He was sick for a week after and died on September 15, 1945, from what officials assumed was food poisoning. No autopsy was performed. This time, she collected $2,000 from his life insurance policy, which was enough for her to buy land and a house near Jacksonville, Alabama. In 1947, Nanny was traveling through Lexington, North Carolina, and placed an ad in the local Lonely Hearts column. Soon after, she met a man named Arlie Lanning, and they married after just three days of knowing each other. Like her former husband, 54-year-old Arlie was an alcoholic and womanizer, and their relationship was tumultuous. While in North Carolina, Nanny became active in the Methodist Church. She even earned sympathy from neighbors and members of her congregation, as it was a well-known fact that Arnie had been known to frequent sex workers. Nanny appeared to be a doting housewife one minute, then would disappear for long stretches of time, sometimes even months. In 1952, Arlie died from what officials thought was heart failure since he was a heavy drinker, and there was a flu virus circulating at the time. It was later revealed that Nanny added rat poison to one of his meals. Doss banked $1,500 in insurance money from his death, but had been shocked to discover that Arnie had left his house to his sister in his will. She packed her TV and belongings into her car and drove back to Arnie's mother's house. Shortly after leaving Arnie's home, it burned to the ground in what was determined to be an accidental fire. A few weeks later, a check for the home insurance was issued, but not to Nanny, as she had assumed. It was made to Arnie and passed to the successor of the property, which was his sister, not his widow. 
In what appeared to be another act of revenge, Arnie's mother died in her sleep, and Nanny cashed the check illegally before leaving North Carolina. She went back to Alabama to care for her sister, Dovey, who was bedridden with cancer. She too passed away soon after Nanny's arrival. Now, Nanny was in her 40s and was still looking for Prince Charming. So, she joined a dating service called the Diamond Circle Club, and in 1952, she met Richard L. Morton, who she married in Emporia, Kansas. Though Richard didn't have a drinking problem, he was a cheater and would be gone for long periods of time with other women. Nanny had struck out in love again. During this time, Nanny's mother, Louisa, had fallen and broken a hip. Her father, James, had passed away at this point, so Nanny took her mother in. But soon after moving in, Louisa started complaining of severe stomach pains. Then, she died. Only a few months later, in May of 1953, Richard died after drinking a thermos of coffee that, unbeknownst to him, Doss had spiked with arsenic. His last words were, I shouldn't have drunk that second cup of coffee. Again, his death wasn't seen as suspicious. Afterward, Nanny received yet another $1,500 life insurance payout. Then, she was on to her next husband, 58-year-old Samuel Doss of Tulsa, Oklahoma, who she again met through a Lonely Hearts column. Samuel was a minister who disapproved of the romance novels Nanny read. He also wouldn't let her read her true detective magazines, have a radio, or watch television with the neighbors. Nanny knew soon into their marriage that things weren't going to work out. By September of 1954, he had developed flu-like symptoms and was admitted to a Tulsa hospital, where he stayed for a month and was diagnosed with a severe digestive tract infection. His doctor suspected foul play, but had no proof. Samuel got better while in the hospital and was released on October 5th back into the care of his wife but suddenly died less than a week later. The sudden death alerted Samuel's doctor, who ordered an autopsy that revealed Samuel had enough arsenic in his body to kill a horse. He immediately contacted the police, and Nanny Doss was arrested. As it turns out, Doss had taken two life insurance policies out on Samuel and needed him dead. First, she had tried poisoning his prune cake with arsenic, which landed him in the hospital. When that didn't work, she laced his coffee with arsenic, which killed him. In her confession, she said she killed Samuel because he got on my nerves. Newspapers got a hold of the story, and soon, tips started pouring in about Doss's many late husbands and others who have died in her wake. Initially, Doss denied any connection to her late husbands, when asked about Richard Morton, for example, she said she'd never heard of him. When faced with proof, she said with a giggle, Well, I guess I wasn't telling the truth. I was married to him. Over the next couple of days, Doss laid out a string of confessions, stating, Now my conscience is clear. Doss reportedly laughed and giggled like a schoolgirl, recounting the events of a pleasant summer vacation and often gave bizarre little asides that demonstrated her lack of compassion. Doss was charged with the murder of Samuel Doss, and in May of 1955, she pleaded guilty to avoid a murder trial. She was sentenced to life in prison, avoiding the death penalty. She eventually confessed to killing four of her husbands, her mother, her sister, her grandson, and her mother-in-law. Authorities exhumed several of Doss's victims' bodies and found large quantities of either arsenic or rat poison in their systems. The state justice departments of North Carolina, Kansas, and Alabama also charged her for the murders committed in those states, though she was only tried in Oklahoma. Doss was reportedly lining up her next husband when Samuel died, a North Carolina dairy farmer named John H. Keel who she had been exchanging letters with for some time. When investigators contacted him, he said, I'm mighty proud I didn't meet her, and she didn't come down here. From now on, I am through with these women who make their matches by mail. 
Due to her killing streak, Doss became known as the Lonely Hearts Killer, the Black Widow, and Lady Bluebeard. Most famously, she was dubbed the Giggling Granny by journalists because she was so cheerful, smiling for photographers and laughing every time she told the story of how she killed her husbands. Many of these uh, people here are from the press, and they uh, want to take a picture of you and so forth, following this confession that you've made with regard to the death of Mr. Doss and uh, Mr. Morton in Emporia, Kansas. And they want to know whether or not, of course, you, you feel all right now, do you? Yes, sir. I feel very good. Y'all have all been very nice to me. I've had good meals, nice warm beds to sleep in and treated very nice face and never one of them on the floor. I believe you gave, uh, I believe you told uh, Captain Stiggy that you had a, a good lunch today. I did, had a nice lunch. And you had an afternoon as well as sleeping last night. Yes, well. sure did. You agreed to talk to these people uh, to tell them that we had treated you all right and not mistreated you. You certainly haven't mistreated me. Y'all have been very nice to me. I would ask for anybody being nicer than you people on the force have been. You uh, made this statement or both of these statements of your own free will and accord, Yes, sir. Voluntarily, isn't that right? Yes, sir. No one has threatened you or promised you anything. Right? No, sir. While she collected a hefty sum of money through the insurance payouts, Doss said she wasn't in it for the cash. I was searching for the perfect mate, the real romance in life, she said. Influenced by the romance magazines she read growing up, she would kill off a husband when they became too much for her, and then would continue her search for her one true love. Investigators believe she committed the murders for the money and convenience, and relatives said she seemed to enjoy planning her victims' funerals and writing their epitaphs. Doss blamed her actions on the brain injury she suffered as a child. Psychiatrists at the Eastern State Hospital in Veneta observed Doss for 90 days and declared her mentally defective, though a Tulsa County jury found her legally sane. As a silver lining, Doss's case led to the Oklahoma legislature passing a law that requires medical examiners to examine all individuals who died without being attended by a physician. Nanny Doss died from leukemia in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary Hospital Ward in 1965, retaining her infamous reputation. While in prison, she told an interviewing reporter, When they get shorthanded in the kitchen here, I always offer to help out but they never let me. She died at 59 years old. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you liked this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. And if you could give a like if you enjoyed the content, that would be much appreciated. We also have channel membership or Patreon if you want to get more behind the scene content as well as exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you will also find all of my socials linked to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.